show you a few examples of, of uh, hypothesis testing problems in which, in which th there is some kind of a combinatorial structure which makes it uh, interesting. So uh, we, we saw one, the, the hidden click problem, but so this, th these are some related problems in, in some sense. So here's uh, the first one. Um, this is a hypothesis uh, testing problem which, which one observes uh, an n-dimensional vector, and this is, uh, uh, this is a Gaussian vector. Okay? And, uh, <coughs> and it's a very simple uh, problem. Under the null hypothesis, this is just noise. Right? The, the, the components are independent uh, standard normal uh, random variables. And the alternative hypothesis is that there exists a small set of the components such that the means over those components are different, are non-zero. Okay? Right? So there's a small set of size k okay, of the components that are uh, different. <laughs> let's, say, let's say this mu is positive. I can, uh, and let's say we know this mu. Okay? And we want to detect. Now what makes this problem a little bit interesting is that we know that there is a class of possible subsets of size k that, are, that, that can happen. Okay, so not, uh, not, not all, sub, uh, all uh, subsets of, uh, not necessarily all subsets of, of size k can be, we call it contaminated, okay? But we know this, that, that there's a, some kind of a structured set, okay? So th th this is the hypothesis testing problem. We want to, we observe one such vector and we want to know, is this just uh, pure noise or is there a, a, a sparse signal somewhere where we know what, what, where the signal could be? And the question is, given such a class of sets, for what values of mu is, is detection possible? Okay. All right. Is this clear? So that's, uh, that's the problem. Uh, did I say everything? So the, the distribution, uh, when, when the set S is the, is the contaminated one, so this distribution is denoted by P sub S. Okay. Uh, otherwise, P sub 0 is the null hypothesis. So th here are some examples. Uh, so the, uh, when there's no structure, so all, all possible subsets of size k are possible, this is a, this is a classical multiple testing problem, and, and, and in the statistic literature, this has been studied very thoroughly. This is very well understood. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, a, a richer or more, more interesting example where, where there's some kind of uh, combinatorial structure is when, when we have a grid, okay? And, uh, and on, on every edge of the grid, there, there is a normal random variable sitting. And, uh, and there is, we know that uh, the alternative hypothesis is that there's a path from this corner to this corner, a monotone path, over which the, the, uh, the, 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 the means are shifted. Okay? And this was studied by Arias Castro and Candace and Donahoe. Okay? Another... Uh, uh, there are all kinds of other examples of, of this type. Okay? So I, I will uh, say a few words about, for example, the, the, an interesting example is when you, we have a, a complete graph. On, on every edge of the complete graph, there is there's a, uh, there's a, a, an independent normal random variable. And, and there is one spanning tree over which the, 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 <laughs> the means are different. Okay? And we want to detect if, if, if there is such a spanning tree. Okay? For, for each example, I can, I can invent a story. <laughs> but now, so, some of them are actually meaningful. So, for example, when, when we have bike clicks, right? You, you can have uh, patients and genes, and then, uh, and then uh, if there, is there a matching, or is, is there a bike click that, that some genes are expressed, uh, are expressed in some group of people? And so, there, there, are, there are papers that, that come from actual motivations of this type. Okay? Okay, so, so a test is just a function that observes such a vector and, and outputs 0 or 1. 0 is if we, if we, if we think that there is no signal and 1 uh, otherwise. And uh, exactly the, the same way as, as, uh, as in the first lecture, we can, uh, we can define the risk as the sum of the two uh, types of errors. Okay, so the, this is the, uh, if, if uh, the di true distribution is 0, but our test thinks that there is signal, right? This is the type 1 error. And the type 2 error is 
the same way as before, we, we defined as the average of the, uh, of the probabilities. So this is when, when uh, the set, so this is a kind of this Bayesian uh, uh, setup. Okay, so this is the average of the, of the errors over all possible subsets that may be contaminated. Okay, and uh, writing, uh, writing it this way is, uh, is nice because, because we know exactly what the optimal test is. The optimal test is the likelihood ratio test, right? So we look at for each possible observation vector, we can compute the density under this mixture distribution and the density, which is just the standard normal density, and we look at the ratio. So the likelihood ratio is written here. It's, uh, it's the average over all, all uh, subsets. And this is e to the mu. Mu is, uh, is, our, is the, the, the strength of the, our signal. And x sub s is just the sum of the components over that subset. Okay, so the likelihood ratio has this nice form. It looks like a partition function. Okay. So, so we, uh, the, 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 the optimal test is the one that compares this to one. If it's bigger than one, then the, we accept the alternative hypothesis. If the likelihood ratio is smaller than one, then we ac accept the, the null hypothesis. And the, the risk of the, optimal, uh, of the optimal test is this expression. Right? This is a standard uh, statistic, exactly like in the first lecture. Right? It's one minus one half times the expected value under the null, so the, un the under the standard normal of the absolute value, absolute difference between the likelihood ratio and one, okay? And so, so we are interested in the study of this, okay? So uh, in particular, if mu is very small, then of course there's no test that can tell the two distributions apart. So when mu is uh, zero, then this, this equals one. And as mu increases, the problem becomes easier and easier, so this is a decreasing function, okay? So we, we want to, we, we want to, we want to understand when is this small, for what values of mu does this become small, okay? And this will depend on the structure of this class, all right? Sorry? K is the size, uh, yeah, K is the size of, the, of these sets, okay? So we have N components, and, and K, is, which is typically much smaller, is, is, the, si is, the, uh, is, is the, the size of each. I, I, I assume that in, in, in every, element of this class C, all these sets have the same size. Just, uh, okay. This is not necessary, but makes things a little bit simpler. Okay, so, so an obvious test is we, we just, uh, we just uh, sum the weight. Okay, this is really easy. If mu is large, then, then this should already detect the signal, right? Because if uh, under the null hypothesis, this is a normal with mean zero, under the, uh, the alternative hypothesis, this is an, a normal with, mu, with, with mean mu times k. Okay? The variances are the same. So, so, so this test will be able to detect whenever mu is bigger than square root of n over k squared. Okay? So that's, that's trivial. And it's, it's interesting that in many cases, this is already pretty close to, to, the, to the best, uh, best one. Another uh, very simple uh, test is the so-called so scan statistic test. Okay, so in, in the scan statistic, we look at, <coughs> we, look at uh, we scan through all possible candidates and, and take the sum of the components over all those candidates. Okay, so for example, in the example of the spanning trees, for each, spanning, each possible spanning tree, there are many of them, we, we, we compute the sum over the edges we maximize this actually can be computed quickly for, for the case of uh, spanning trees and uh, and we threshold it okay so where, where do we threshold it well under the null hypothesis this is what we expect right? this is the expected value of the of the maximum of these st standard gaussians okay but there's so this is just the maximum of a gaussian process it has some maximum and uh, under the alternative hypothesis well this there exists one of these sets where there's signal, so one of them should be at least mu times k, okay? So we just look at what, we just threshold halfway between these two, okay? So if mu times k is much bigger than this thing, then this will, this test will work, okay? And it will work because, uh, because this random variable is very concentrated because of the Gaussian uh, con concentration inequality, okay? So one, one can show that if mu is bigger than this quantity, the, the, the ratio of the, of the expected maximum of this Gaussian process, 
over k, then, uh, <coughs> then this test will work. Okay, so this is the, this, uh, this is the, uh, the scan statistic test. Okay? Now, interestingly, in all, all examples I know, one of these two, two, two simple tests is, is near optimal. Near optimal up to constant factors. Okay? So it's, if you really want to nail the optimal test, then of course you have, you have to be a little bit more sophisticated. But, but one of these two tests, counting, uh, just, just taking the average or looking at the, the maximum over, over all possible subsets, one of these two is, uh, is usually good. And so how do we know that? Well, we can, uh, we can look at lower bounds. Okay. And we, we do it exactly the same way as we did it for the hidden click problem. So, so the, 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 the true risk, the best risk, right? We, we had this expression in terms of the, in terms of the uh, likelihood ratio. Well, this is a complicated random variable, but, but Chebyshev's inequality, sorry, a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality will, uh, will help because this guy is computable very nicely. Okay, this is just... This is just the expected value of the, of the likelihood ratio squared minus 1. And uh, we can calculate that. And we get something nice, which only depends on the combinatorics of this class. So what, what do we get? The, the, uh, the risk is greater than 1 minus 1 half times the square root of. And what's this is the, is the moment generating function of this random variable z, which we obtain by, by taking our class of sets, right? the possible uh, sets. Pick two at random and look at the uh, look at the overlap. Okay, so we choose two sets independently at random. Look at uh, look at the overlap, and now we should understand the uh, the moment generating function of that. It's really nice because it's a purely combinatorial quantity. All the all the Gaussians are gone. Well, and th th this is really easy. You just write down what this is, and that's what pops out. Okay. Yes. So C is, a, is a, C is our class of all possible sets. So Z. Z is, so from our class of all possible sets, I choose two okay. independently at random, and I look at the overlap. The cardinality. The cardinality. I count how many, uh, yeah, the, the intersection. Okay. okay. So that's, uh, that's this random variable. So now we can play, right? Now we can, uh, we can, uh, we can try to understand the behavior of this. <coughs> so here, here's a, a little curiosity, uh, which, uh, <laughs> so it, which, which somehow will come back uh, in the second half of my talk. That uh, that sometimes when we when we study uh, hypothesis testing problems, we can say something about probability, uh, about random quantities that would may be difficult to analyze otherwise. So here's here's something uh, strange. So take take. Mu c to be um, to be this critical value, okay? So when when this equals two, this uh, this uh, right? When uh, when uh, when this moment generating function equals two, then this is one. So this is just one half, right? It's greater than one half. So so at that value, <coughs> the risk is at least one half, okay? But we also know that the scan statistic statistic test performs better than this whenever mu is greater than that. Okay? All right. So we have a lower bound, but then we, we have an upper bound. So these are in conflict. And therefore, we get a lower bound for the expected maximum of a Gaussian process in terms of this strange quantity. Okay? So I don't know, but there are people here who know about Gaussian processes. I, I haven't seen this example. And, and, and in some cases, of course, the expected maximum of a Gaussian process, this is very well understood. Talagran wrote thick books about this. But, uh, but, but, uh, but, the, but computing what this is is not always easy. And, uh, and with, with this little trick, sometimes we get things. I will show you how one can, one can get interesting bounds for this. Yeah? Sometimes this new sub C doesn't exist. <coughs> No, there, there's, al there's always some chance that you pick the same, right? Oh, I see. The, the, so there, there's, it's, it's always well defined. Okay. All right. So in, 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 no, no, clearly not always sharp. 
but in it, it uh, uh, computed in some cases and uh, in some non-trivial cases it seems you, to be sharp. Uh, no, but maybe maybe vice versa, it, it would work. But it's not so clear. So I, I, it's not so clear. Okay. So the, the 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 typical way of lower bounding these things is is that we take a packing of the of, of the set of, of this class and then and work over that. That's uh, that's called Sudakov's lower bound. Okay. This is a, somehow in a very different spirit. Right? We, we take we take we take random subsets. We look at the overlap, compute the the moment generating function, and get that. So one way of uh, when when uh, when one can get very nice lower bounds is uh, <coughs> is when we have a negative association. Okay. So uh, so suppose um, suppose that the, the cl class is symmetric just for the case of discussion. So that means that when I when I pick two sets, I can fix the first set, and the distribution is not going to depend on what the first set is. Okay. So let's. Take one of the, the the first set to be one to, uh, to k, the first uh, k components, and now take an s that's random that, that that's chosen randomly. Okay, so then uh, then the the size of the overlap is just the the number of these indicators, right? Okay, now in some cases one can prove that, that these these indicators are negatively associated. Okay, and if if it if they are, then it's very easy to 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 get uh, this lower bound. Okay? So the risk is going to be greater than 1 half whenever mu is smaller than square root of log n over k squared. Okay? This just happens to come out. I, I'm not going to show you the, the proof, but it's really simple. It, it just comes, comes out from writing it. Okay? So, so the negative association of these indicators, yeah. or, or characterize it in terms of the class. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. But uh, okay, I haven't thought about it. But but here, here's a nice example: um, spanning trees. So, in, in the case of spanning trees, this is true. This negative association true is this uh, goes back to to these guys, Feder and Mihai. They prove that that, uh, that if, if if we take a random uh, spanning tree, then and we look at two edges. Right? Whether they are the indicator that the, the, the two that that two edges are in the uh, both of them are in the in the same spanning tree, they are negatively associated. Okay. So in this case, uh, well, n is so if we have a complete graph on m vertices, we have m choose two uh, coordinates. Okay. K equals m minus one because that's how many edges each uh, spanning tree has. There are lots of lots of spanning trees, right? M, m to the m minus two. That's Cayley's formula. And uh, and from what I showed you, we get we get this lower bound. Okay. So in particular, we get, we get a we get a lower bound. So this is one example in which it seems difficult to prove a lower bound for the expected maximum of the Gaussian process, but with this we sh we, we get that it's lower bounded by a constant. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it's interesting that. Uh, in this particular case, the likelihood ratio can uh, test the optimal test can be computed efficiently, by uh, because because there's this nice algorithm of Prop and Wilson that tells you how to uh, how to uh, uh, take really simple algorithm to to generate a random spanning tree uh, such that uh, such that the edges su such that the uh, the probability of the tree is proportional to to, to, to the product of the weights of the edges. And here the weights will be just e to the mu times the, uh, mu times the, uh, the normal on the edges. So in this case, there is a, a fast algorithm to compute the, 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 the true, uh, well, fast randomized algorithm to, to compute the, the true, uh, 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 true uh, uh, likelihood ratio test. Okay. Uh, here's another example. Perfect matchings. So, so here, uh, here we have uh, uh, what what we choose is a permutation. Okay, right. So, so, so the, imagine the, uh, the the complete bipartite graph on m vertices. Maybe, maybe there's another slide before. Yeah, here, complete bipartite graph. Okay, there's a, a Gaussian sitting on every edge, and uh, and we we have to decide whether there's somewhere a perfect matching. 
on which the mu's are greater. Okay, so there are again m squared is the is the number of variables. M is the size of each perfect matching. There are many of them. Okay, and in this case, in this case, uh, it's the the uh, the uh, the size of the of the overlap is just the number of fixed points in a in a random permutation. So this is very well understood, and one can one can show that a, a lower bound. So R star is going to be greater than one half whenever mu is smaller than this constant and. And the optimal test is also of the cons of uh, the, the simple uh, averaging test also gives some other constant. Okay, so these methods uh, I, because I think we'll be losing Cauchy-Schwarz, so we, we don't really get we we, ne we never get the right constant, but we, we usually get the right order of magnitude. Okay, and in this case again, the uh, the uh, <coughs> the optimal test well it just uh, amounts to computing the permanent of a of a matrix which is which has non-negative entries, and uh, there we have this famous paper of Jerome Sinclair and Vigoda that, that, that shows you how one, this can, that can be computed in uh, uh, in polynomial time with, with a randomized uh, uh, algorithm. Okay, so so that's an, another case when when these complicated likelihood ratio tests can actually actually be computed efficiently. Okay. <coughs> There are some other examples, but I will skip them. So here's a, here's a problem that uh, for, for all of you who, who look for hard and maybe hopeless problems. So, so the, the, the optimal risk is, is a decreasing function, right? As, as mu becomes larger, the, the problem becomes, the, the, the testing problems become easier. It starts at one, it goes down to zero. Now, is it true that it, all, it almost always, under mild conditions on what this set is, is it true it should go down like it's big and boom, go down to zero? Is there a sharp threshold? Okay, and by sharp threshold, I mean that if, uh, if mu sub epsilon is, uh, is where, where this function equals epsilon, where the risk, risk equals epsilon, right? So we, lo we look at the, the, the location where where, uh, the, where the risk is already down to epsilon, and we look at the location where it's still one minus epsilon, is it true that these two are really close to each other? How close? Well, closer than, than the, let's say, the size of the middle point. Okay. Yeah. So this uh, case small, you still expect this to have No. Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> yeah. No. No. It, it, no. I don't. But but when k is large, I, I think this should be true. So yeah, so yeah, it should be the case that if the class is somehow sufficiently symmetric, then uh, then this goes down to zero. Um, we, we spend some time on it, but we don't get anywhere. Hmm? We 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 looked at theorems of that type, but but we couldn't really. It's a Gaussian problem, so it's not really in that framework. So there there are notions of geometric influences and stuff like that, but. Uh, we, Maybe that's the way, but uh, we couldn't work it out. Okay. okay. <coughs> for, I, I th for the case sets, I think this is known, because, because you can really study what the optimal tests look like, so when, when there's no combinatorial structure. But in, in general, this could be interesting. Okay. <coughs> so uh, in the second half of the talk, we, we look at a different kind of, uh, but very, very related, but different uh, testing problem. So here uh, we will test not, uh, so again we will observe uh, Gaussian vectors, but here uh, the, the, uh, the, the alternative hypothesis is not going to be that, that the mean is shifted, the mean will be zero always, but that, that some components will be correlated. Okay, so here's a, here's a motivating story. We have uh, N sensors out there in, uh, in outer space, and, uh, and all of these sensors collect signals, okay? And uh, <coughs> the i sensors receives uh, some signal during d periods of time. And, uh, and uh, under the null hypothesis, this is all pure noise. Everything is uh, standard normal. But under the alternative hypothesis, there are, there's a small subset of these sensors that pick up a common signal, okay? But embedded in, hidden in this additive noise. So this 
this y t at time t, t goes from 1 to d, at time t, uh, we, ha we have a common signal that, that, that some of the sensors pick up. Okay? Now, can we, for what values, and oh, this is just normalizing, normalizing so that the, so that the, uh, um, the, the variance is 1. Okay? From the story point of view, oh, because we just normalize so that everything has the same. I, yeah, it it, sh in, uh, it doesn't really matter. It makes the math a little bit simpler. It doesn't really matter. Of course, it it can matter if if by simply looking at the. But that, then the problem is easy, anyways. Okay. So if it matters, then uh, if it matters, then uh, then it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let, let just okay. You're right. You're right. Uh, Okay, forget the story, look at the math. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> so, so these yt's are normal uh, with mean zero and variance rho. And this rho is, we, we want to understand how, how large rho can be. And now, <clears throat> uh, again, this, this, the, the possible class of sets may have some structure. I'm just going to now look at the case when, uh, when there, there's no structure. All, all, but but you, can, you can look at the same story as before. But let, let's just suppose that there's no structure. All sets of size k are possible. Okay. All right. So here's uh, the same thing written in a kind of different way. We, we observe d independent vectors. Okay. And under the null hypothesis, all the components of these vectors are independent. But under the alternative, there's a small subset of components that are correlated. The pairwise correlations are equal to rho. Okay, so the, 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 co the covariance matrix is, looks like there, there are some, uh, some uh, k, there, there are k variables such that the pairwise correlations are rules, otherwise you have zero. Okay, so these are these vectors. Okay. So <coughs> again, a test now takes this whole matrix, right? These, these d observations of, uh, of n vectors. And, uh, and again, this is the same story as before. We look at the sum of the, uh, of the two types of errors. Now we have n choose k possible sets. Okay? All right. Uh, there is a likelihood ratio test that we can write down. It looks ugly. It's, it, it, it involves a big sum. Um, but we can, uh, we can try to obtain lower bounds. Now, the, the usual technique that we used using uh, Cauchy-Schwarz doesn't work this way. Right? Remember that R star is, is 1 minus 1 half times the L1 distance between, uh, the, between L of x and 1, and we, we, we bounded it by, by this. It doesn't work because this expected value in this case is infinite. Okay? So we, we have to do something. And the, the, the way, way to do it is that, uh, is that we condition on, uh, on, on the value of the signal of, the, uh, of those yt's, and then uh, if, if you condition, then it becomes something like the shifted mean problem that, that I, we, we talked about, right? If we condition on, uh, uh, where was it? If, if we condition on this, then, then this is exactly like as, as it was before. But now the means are these, these yt's, OK? Of course, these are random, but, but one, one can work it out there. They behave nicely. So, so that's how we get this, this lower bound. Don't look at the form. That's not uh, too interesting. Uh, well, just that there is an inequality of that sort. Okay. And again, if, if, we, if, we, if we have now the class of, if we have a structured uh, class of sets, then again, this can be expressed in, the, in, uh, in terms of the moment generating function of the exact same random variables before. Okay. So we can get lower bounds for, uh, for, uh, for the, the optimal risk in terms of the same uh, combinatorial quantity as before. So one can read off some, ni some immediate uh, inequalities from this, and there are some nice phase transitions. So if, if d is small, right, the number of observations is much smaller than log n over rho, then, uh, then the lower bound says that this cannot ever go to 0 unless k is really large, almost root n. Okay? But if d is a little bit larger than this, just a constant uh, times larger than that, then, uh, then the risk will go to zero, the optimal risk, even if k is a constant. Okay. 
So, so if, if d is smaller than log n, log n over rho, then, uh, then even if, if k is l large, almost root n, there's nothing you can do. But if we, we go a little bit above, then all of a sudden, even constant k will work. Okay? And that constant, uh, th this upper bound can be achieved by just a scan statistic. Okay? So what's a scan statistic? Well, we, we, uh, we go through all possible sets. And we compute, within that set, we compute pairwise correlations. Okay? So we, we sum over all ij pairs, the products. Right? Because we know that over the contaminated set, the expected value of this is rho. Otherwise, it's 0. Okay? So, uh, so under the uh, alternative hypothesis, when there exists such a set, this should be at least, well, this is rho times k choose 2 times d. Right? Something like that. So if we threshold at half of that, then we get, we get that upper bound. Okay? So this, uh, of course, has to be worked out. We have to understand the, the concentration behavior of, of such Gaussian quadratic forms, but this is not too difficult. Okay? All right. If you, if, yeah? you, if you don't have the same row, but you have uh, different rows, can you get something similar in terms of maximum variance? Uh, that's a good question. We haven't looked at it. it yeah. yeah it's, 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 and it's, of course, it's a natural question. It's natural? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So, so here's, here's one way of, uh, of, uh, of constructing a test. OK? So we have all these vectors. OK? We have uh, uh, now n vectors, n d dimensional vectors. OK? And under the null hypothesis, they are, uh, their pairwise correlations are, are zero. Under the alternative hypothesis, there exists a small number of them such that the pairwise correlations are, are larger. Okay? So we, we might set up a graph in which uh, these vectors are the vertices. Okay? And I would draw an edge between two vertices if the, if the pairwise empirical correlation is larger than some threshold. And now we will look at this graph. Okay. Under the uh, null hypothesis, uh, these points will be randomly, so the probability of each edge. Let's say I, if I threshold this at 0, then the probability of an edge will be 1 half. Under the uh, alternative hypothesis, there will be a small subgraph such that, uh, such that the, uh, the, 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 the pairwise correlations are larger, so they will be more likely to, to, to be connected. Okay? So this sounds a little bit like that hidden click problem. Well, hidden, uh, we, we are trying to find uh, a, a denser subgraph, but this is not, not an Erdős-Rényi graph, right? Because, uh, because now we have geometry. All these points, so the xi divided by the, the norm of xi, we will denote them by zi's, they are uniformly distributed on the sphere. Okay, on the d-dimensional sphere. So now we have these d points on the sphere. Under the null hypothesis, they are random. So it's just a, uh, this graph is just a so-called random geometry graph on this, on this sphere. And under the alternative hypothesis, we, we, we have a so small subset of points that are somehow tend to be closer to each other. Okay. So a natural test is just to look at the, the, the size of the largest click in this graph. So, OK, good. So this is a nice object. Uh, it's a random geometric graph. And, uh, and now one can try to, I will skip these two slides. It's kind of nice to understand uh, what happens when, uh, when, uh, when p, the connection, when we don't threshold at 0, but we threshold it somewhere else. But OK, Let, let's, just, uh, let's just concentrate on the case when, uh, <coughs> when p equals 1 half. Okay. So what we do again, we have these end points on the, on the sphere, and we connect two if the probability that they are, if they fall, if, the, if their angle is less than 90 degrees. Okay? All right? That, that means that the inner product is, is, is greater than, uh, than zero. Okay? So any two points, there will be an edge between two points if the inner product is, uh, is positive. Okay? Now, <coughs> What happens to this graph? Well, if d is small, if the, if, the, if the dimension is really small, 
then, uh, then this will behave, this will be a random geometric graph. But as d increases, then, uh, then this will become an Erdős-Rényi graph. Okay? And that's, that's not difficult to see. Okay? So if, as, as the dimension increases, as we add more and more components to these Gaussians, then, uh, then, then what happens? Well, uh, it's here. It's written here. I, we, I can represent this random graph. So I, I denote this by g bar n, d, and p. Okay? So p is, is, uh, is going to be 1 half. It's just the probability that they are connected. n is the number of points, and d is the, uh, d is the dimension. Okay? So again, we, we are on, on the sphere, uh, unit sphere in d dimensions. We throw down n points at random. We connect two points if, if their angle is, uh, is less than 90 degrees. Okay? But we can represent, this is how we represent it. Now, TBD is, is 0 in this case. Okay? But these guys, this is just the sum of independent random variables. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, and as, as if n is fixed, the number of uh, points is fixed, but the dimension increases, then one can use the, uh, the multivariate, uh, multivariate central limit theorem to show that these guys will converge to normals and, uh, and they will become independent. Okay. So the distribution of this graph converges to the distribution of the Erdős-Rényi graph. Okay. So that's, that's written here. The total variation distance between these two go to zero. Okay. Now, of course, you can ask, how large does the dimension have to be? such that this is small. And there's recent work of uh, Bubek and uh, Eldan, where they prove that, th that there's a nice threshold. So if, uh, if d is much larger than, square, uh, than uh, n cubed, then this will be very small. But if d is smaller than n cubed, then, th then this will be still large. Okay. Hmm? P is 1 half. P is constant. P is a constant. So for constant p, yeah, if, if, if P, if for sparse graphs, we don't understand anything, basically. But for dense graphs, when P is 1 half or, or a constant, then, then, uh, then the threshold is somewhere when the dimension is n cubed. OK? Right? Stein's method seems to be a very natural way of getting, uh, getting estimates on these. Yeah, that's not how they do it. Uh, they, they, they analyze the Wishart matrix and uh, do some hard work. Stein, yeah, and, and, for, for, and, they, con and they construct tests. So in, on one, for, for the lower bounds, they construct tests, clever tests. And for the upper bounds, they analyze the Wishart matrices and stuff like that. So I don't know if any, anybody looked at the Stein's method. That, that's interesting. OK, but, uh, but what we are interested in, in, the, in the, as I said, that for, for our testing problem, what we, we are interested in is understanding is the, is the, the click number. Right? Because our we, we construct this graph, and we want to say whether, uh, whether there's signal or not. Uh, if, if there's signal, then, then, then we expect that there's, there will be a large click in this graph, right? if, if there are points that are more correlated. There's a small subset of points that are correlated. In the, so, so in order to do that, we want, uh, we want to understand the click number of, of this random geometric graph. Okay? In particular, it would be nice to understand what, how does this behave in terms of the dimension. Right? As the dimension grows, what happens? If the dimension is fixed, if, if the dimension is 2 or, or, or 3 or something like that, okay, then uh, <coughs> Then the click number will be large, right? Because in, let's say in the three-dimensional sphere, if I throw down n points, then there will be many of them that will be that are pairwise orthogonal. I mean, uh, pairwise uh, their distance, their pairwise angle is less than uh, 90 degrees, right? Because it's simply everything that falls in a spherical cap of of angle 45 degrees, they, they will form a click. Okay. So so I can't, so the, the the click number is linear. When d is fixed, then the click number, the size of the largest click is linear in n. Right? There, there are clicks of linear size. But when d goes to infinity, the, this will converge to, the, uh, to the, the, the click number of the erdos rényi graph. And we know that that's, that's only logarithmic in n. Okay? So we wanted to understand what happens 
as we increase d, right? From constant to infinity, how does it, it go down from linear to, to logarithmic? Okay, and this is important for understanding the, st the testing problem because this, this will tell us how, how long we have, we have to wait until we, we can confidently uh, say that there is signal. Okay. And uh, so here are, here's the list of, uh, of, of bounds. So let's, uh, let's go through what happens. So as I said already, when d is constant, when the, the dimension is con constant and n goes to infinity, then we have clicks of linear size. Okay. And uh, it's easy to see that as soon as d goes to infinity, the clicks are not going to be linear size. That's, that's very, very easy to see. Okay. Now, if d is much smaller than log n, then it's still easy to see that the same argument will tell you that there are still clicks, not quite linear, but almost linear. All right. But then something happens when d is log squared of n. So when, when d is log squared of n, and we, we can only prove this for the case when p is less than 1 half, not for, but it should be true also for p is half, then d is log squared n. Okay. So if d is log squared n, then, uh, then the click number is already polylogarithmic. Okay. So there's a big jump between, uh, between less than log n and log squared n. It goes down from, from now, if the dimension is log cubed of n, then it really starts looking like the, the click number of the other Schrödinger graph. It's 2 log, two, log base 2 n. Okay. And if we go a little bit further, then, uh, then we, we really nail down what happens with the, if, um, up, to, up to the constant, the additive constant, the, uh, uh, the, the, the click number is that. Okay. And there's this, yeah? Login? Sorry? Log n, nothing happens? Uh, uh, log n, uh, something thing happens. Okay, uh, so, so here, th this thing tells you something about what happens. So here, here's, a, here's a lower bound. That for example, it tells you that if d is log n to the 2 minus epsilon, okay, then this is much bigger than anything polylogarithmic. Okay? So, so th there's a big jump between d to the log 2 minus epsilon n and, and, uh, and, uh, and log squared n. Okay? It goes from some, something like e to the log n to, to some power to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to polylogarithmic, to, to log squared n. Right? So th there's a big jump here. Uh, it also tells you, well, here d has to be at least a constant times log n, but if it's a big constant times log n, then, then we see that it's still, it's still uh, a polynomial. It's n to some power. Okay? So there, there seem to be two different kind of jumps. One at log n and one at, uh, at log n when it goes from polynomial to, to, to subpolynomial, and then at, at log squared n when it goes from kind of subpolynomial to, to, to polylogarithmic. Okay, and then, then it smooths out. Okay. So in the remaining six minutes, I will prove all of these things. <laughs> okay, uh, so m maybe I can say a few words about how we prove this, because it's kind of interesting. Um, so <coughs> we found this theorem by Jung from uh, 1901 <laughs> that says that, um, that for every set of, a, of, uh, of diameter at most one, right, if we have a set of, of is the, then there we can find a, a, a closed set, a closed ball of this radius in which we can include those, that set. Okay? And this is just a little bit better than, uh, than, than tri completely trivial, okay? But that is, that is enough for us because, uh, <coughs> because we can use uh, uh, the wapnik chervenenkis theorem, okay? So, uh, <coughs> so uh, here, uh, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna go through, but, but ba basically, uh, basically what happens is that, is that a click is just a set of, uh, of, uh, of a certain diameter, right? That's, that's what we know. And now we can include it in a ball, which is just a little bit better than, than trivial, right? And, uh, and then we can use, and, and now the size of the click is just the, is just the empirical measure of, of such a spherical cap, right? So the size of a click is now upper bounded by, by the, 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 the spherical, the, the measure of the spherical cap, of, of, which is this ball that contains our, our click, okay? 
But we know what the measure of such a spherical cap is, because we can just compute it. And, uh, and, we, and we can use the VC theorem that says that in a, in a d-dimensional space, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the difference between the, the, the empirical measure and the true measure cannot be too big. It depends on, on the ratio of the dimension and, and then. Okay? So if we put these things together, that's how we get uh, this line. Okay? Now, <coughs> these guys that say that if d is large, larger than log cube n or log to the fifth n, this, uh, this goes with the, uh, this is just uh, the first moment method. Okay? So, <coughs> so if nk is the number of clicks of size k, right? this is the expected, uh, then the expected number is uh, n choose k. Sorry, this is in the, in the other strain graph, right? n choose k times 2 to the minus k half. Right? And what we can prove is that the expected number of, of clicks of size k is bounded by n choose k. Okay, that's the same. And this thing is some number, which is not 1 half, to the power of k choose 2, essentially. But this number, this is just the, uh, this is just the, uh, the standard normal distribution function at delta. Okay? So if delta is small, then this is close to 1 half. Okay? And this is, if delta, de well, how small is delta? Well, there, there's, we have this, uh, this condition here. And, and we play with that. Okay? And how do you prove such a thing? Well, this is concentration. Okay? So if we have, uh, if we have independent, independent points of, of, of the sphere, well, these are basically normalized independent Gaussians. Right? And we, we want to say, what's the probability that if we throw down k Gaussians, then they, they're pairwise, they will be pairwise better than orthogonal. Okay? And you can do this by, by induction doing a, a kind of Gram-Smith uh, orthogonalization at each step and then taking, track, uh, taking care of the, of the errors. It's a little bit technical, but not, not too hard. This is the, the principle. So one, one can get an upper bound for the expected number of, expected number of uh, clicks of size k. And then that by the, uh, the first moment method that we saw last time uh, gives us an upper bound for the uh, click number. OK. All right. And yeah, it doesn't work. It just falls short of, for some yeah, that that spherical cap that we get is just everything. So that's just not enough. But it yeah, there should morally there should be no difference. But uh, but this proof doesn't work. Yeah. And uh, finally, I want to say how do, do we get, how do we prove a lower bound of this sort? Okay, so we have a. Uh, we have uh, this random geometry graph. Uh, we have this random geometry graph, and, uh, and uh, how do we show that, uh, that the, the largest click has to be large if, if the dimension is. Uh, s sorry, what, what does it say? Uh, yeah, so if the dimension is small, then it has to be large. So, how do we prove such a thing? If I hadn't told you the story of testing, then this would be hard. But we, we have all our hypothesis tests. So this is another example when we can, we can draw something from uh, our hypothesis testing formulation and say something about, about something, uh, some, some complicated probabilistic quantities. Okay? Why? Because, because uh, if the largest click was small, okay, suppose that the largest click under, the, the, uh, 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 under this model is small, well, that means that the, uh, that the detection problem becomes easy, right? Because, because now if, if we don't put in signal, that will, uh, that will induce a large click, and then these, these two distributions can be, uh, can be told apart very easily, okay? So if the largest click was small, then there would be a test. But we know we have this universal lower bounds for the risk of the best test that say that that is impossible. So we just put these things together. So just from, from, uh, from the impossibility of, of finding good hypothesis tests, one can prove lower bounds for the click number of such a graph. Okay? And uh, the, the only little uh, ingredient this is easy that, that one needs is that is, is a performance for, for, for the test. But under the alternative hypothesis, the graph does contain a large click. Okay? If, do, if rho is sufficiently large, right, rho is this thing, if rho is sufficiently large, and, uh, and k is uh, not too large.
Okay. So that's it. Um, everything is written up here. So you go to my home page and uh, you type in this. It's, uh, the, there's the, all the proofs are there, and, the, and the, these are some of the references that, uh, that contain the results that I, I mentioned. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. So uh, uh, does this first moment method work uh, when the dimension t is less than the cube of the log? No. We, well, uh, why? I, because we are not good enough, not skilled if enough. But, uh, but it might, it might, but, but we, we do it by induction and uh, somehow, yeah. It, it might work if you're more clever than us. But, uh, but we, we have conjecture on uh, what is the, is the gravity behavior as a function of both d and n of, of the click number. Yes. Apart from, uh, so you mean fill in these holes? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so the conjecture, the, the conjecture is, is something like this, that, uh, that uh, up to log n, we have this almost n, right? And then uh, shortly after log n, it will drop down to n to the epsilon. Okay, so if, if it's a little bit bigger than log n, it's going to be already n to the epsilon. Well, it has to be at least that, that comes from here. And then, uh, then around log squared, then it, it, it will go down. Up to log squared, then it's still large. Okay. Not, not quite polynomial, but, but, but much bigger than polylogarithmic. And then, then it drops down here to, uh, to polylogarithmic. And then, then it <sighs> yeah, there are holes here. So I, uh, it, yeah, we don't quite know all the details. OK, more questions? OK, let's thank Gabor again, and there will be a lot more.